This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 423, recorded on January 6th, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Palmier. Hello there, Vincent. How are you, Dixon? Oh, I'm pretty good. We have a nice day, don't Actually, we? Actually, I'm better than pretty good. I, I'm cold. feeling fine. Um, looking forward to my uh, next semester of um, undergraduate teaching at Fordham. Yeah, with, which you uh, mistakenly went to today. And I didn't mistakenly go. I went down to find out actually when classes do start at Fordham. Well, now, I, the, now the story is changing. But I've learned that there are about five different times at that campus that some classes start now, some classes start later. Some class. So when you read the website, it does not uh, define which classes start when. Boy, Dixon. So, I'm telling you, that's no okay. way to run a class. I, well, I would agree with you, but at least it didn't start today. So. We had a little snow this night, right? We did. Like an inch? Yeah. And now it's cold? Yeah. I don't know exactly what my weather app isn't working. It's about 35. What the hell with it? It's about 35 degrees. 35. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Hey, we had, snow? Uh, yeah, we had about the same snow you got, an inch, inch and a half, something like that. Hmm. Um, just enough to be a minor annoyance that I had to you know, clear <laughs> off the driveway because it didn't get above freezing today, and it's not supposed to get above freezing until sometime middle of next week. Did so you, you have- use your wovel? <laughs> no, I just used a regular shovel because it was just, you know, I, I could shove the regular shovel across the driveway and the light, dusty snow would just go flying. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hey, so it's plus 12 Fahrenheit, minus 12 Celsius. Oh, look at that. That's kind of nice and symmetrical. Very yeah. It's palindromic. also very cold. <laughs> Actually, yes, not palindromic, cold. but. Yeah, just symmetrical. Yeah. Um, and we had about an inch of that dusty snow that was really sparkly this morning. Mm. It, was, it was very pretty. Nice. I think your pick is in line with that, isn't it? <laughs> yes, definitely. See, Rich Condit will be joining us in a few moments. We have an in-studio guest. You know, the Twift Studio is just a destination. And today we have from Charleston, South Carolina, Jared, welcome Welcome, welcome! Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm I'm thrilled to be one of the lowly paramecium undergrads in this great nexus of virology that is Columbia U. Oh, Lord, oh, boy, <laughs> it's getting deeper now. Here. <laughs> now that the salesmanship's out the way, <laughs> but you um, are here to check out New York City, right? Well, no, I came here first and foremost to meet you. <laughs> right? Uh, no, 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 no. But what if, what if I couldn't make it? When you emailed me, you said, I hope to be able to see you. I would have been so bitter, <laughs> so incredibly bitter. How did you get up here? Did you take a train? No, I took a plane. plane. Believe it or not, tickets to New York for uh, my length of stay were only $63. Really? Wow. For round trip wow. tickets. Oh, That's my cheap. goodness. Oh. And, yeah. you, and you're an undergraduate. Where are you again? Remind me. I'm at the College of Charleston. Okay. Uh Oh, trying to get good. my bachelor's of science in molecular biology and minoring in biomedical physics. Hmm. You're graduating next summer? Uh, this summer, hopefully. And what's, uh, what's next on your agenda? Whatever I can afford. Hopefully some in-lab research for a year and mm-hmm. um, dice through the MCAT and see where the dice fall. All right. Uh-huh. So I, pre- I presume you like TWIV, right? I do. I do indeed. I'm a Patreon supporter of this program. Thank you very How much. lovely. Yes, thank you. It. We all thank. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, I want to tell our Mercedes our... outside is mine. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> really? I was at a I was at a public health meeting once, and they uh, after a break, the um, uh, chair of the session got up and said that there's a there's a Lexus in the parking lot with its lights on, and everybody laughed. <laughs> <laughs> it's not ours. <laughs> no, 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 wrong meeting. Sorry. Right. It's good. It's good. Uh, stay tuned for a new book contest. We have a winner who I will tell you about later and um, can give a new one away. All right. So listen, Kathy, what do you uh, know about ASV? Well, what I know is that the meeting is coming up June 24th to 28th, 2017 in Madison, Wisconsin. And now is the time to really start thinking about your abstracts because they are due February 1st. 
So you submit an abstract, you choose two topics for your first and second choice of workshop, you indicate whether you want to do an oral presentation or a poster, and uh, the program committee looks at it, and not all of the submitted oral uh, requests can get oral requests, but many of them can. And so it's a really good format for students and postdocs to come present their work. And then, of course, in the morning, there are plenary sessions from outstanding virologists. And the beginning of each workshop uh, time slot, in which there are nine concurrent workshops, has a state-of-the-art speaker. So there are a lot of things just in the basic content of the meeting. Uh, many of you have attended before. Then there are all kinds of other things, career workshops, teaching workshops, uh, uh, communications, uh, science and society, various things. And then there are satellite meetings. And I've told you a couple times about one in particular, but there are five. The one in particular is the career planning workshop for junior virologists. And TWIV's own Rich Condit is participating in this workshop. So maybe next week when he's, if he's on in time, we can have him tell a little about what he knows about what's going to happen at that workshop. That particular satellite workshop is free, and it's limited to the first 100 students and postdocs who register. So if that interests you, you should go ahead and sign up now. To get information about all of this, go to asv.org. Click on the annual meeting, then click on annual meeting again, and you'll be then at the University of Wisconsin site. You can bookmark the site and return to it for how to submit your abstract, how to submit your travel grant. Uh, and of course, if you want to submit a travel grant, you need to be an ASV member. So there's links back on the ASV site about how to become a member. I think that's enough for now. I also cool. want to tell you about a joint ASM-ASV conference on the interplay of viral and bacterial pathogens. It's organized by Christian Vobus, Stephanie Karst, Julie Pfeiffer, Stacy Schultz-Cherry, and Vincent Young, all of whom have been on either TWIV or TWIM. This is happening between May 1st and 4th in Bethesda, Maryland. One of the hottest new topics in biomedical research is trans-kingdom interactions between viruses and bacteria in the gut and how they influence health and disease the meeting's co-sponsored by ASM and the American Society for Virology. It's a brand new conference bringing together scientists from different disciplines to study, to discuss cutting-edge research findings related to this topic. Sessions will include understanding the cellular and organismal intestinal host response, and I want to say intestinal, I just, <laughs> you know, but I'm not British. The interplay between enteric viruses, pathogenic bacteria, and microbiota, novel approaches to model intestinal infections, much more. Abstract deadline, February 21st, and we will post a link in the show notes, microbe.tv slash twiv, because it's way too long to mention here. We have some follow-up from last week's episode. First one's from Trudy. Dear Twivers, I'm writing in follow-up to your question about how to say you in the plural form in German. There are two ways to address multiple people in informal situations. One would say ear, while to address multiple people in formal situations, one would say C, always written. Z. 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 With the capital, yeah. I should have had you read this. <laughs> I knew it. Is ear right? Yes, ear is right. Z. Z. Always written with a capital S. Z. And, of course, we're not formal here, so we always say ear. <laughs> For example, if you were to meet several prospective employers in a group interview, never going to happen with me again. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. You would only ever say Z. When it, where it becomes confusing is that you also use Z, also with capital S, to address a single person in a formal context, such as if you were to have a one-on-one -on -one interview with, a, with one prospective employer. The Southern y'all is synonymous to the ear, <laughs> but I can't think of a word that is synonymous to Z other than the boring old you. All the best and happy new year. Y'all can be used on formal occasions. That's oh my God. serendipitous okay. that I'm here from Charleston and we're here. Yes. Uh, you, well, yeah. listen. Notes about y'all. So do you use Z or ear in Charleston? <laughs> oh, I forgot. Never mind. Never mind. Alan, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Ken writes, Dear Vincent and the Twiv Mistress and Masters. <laughs> That's a way to do it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> First, a very happy birthday to Vincent, actually about 18 hours early as I write, and a happy new year to the Twivosphere. Our New Year's Day in Portland, Oregon started out with a light dusting of snow, which unfortunately turned into slush, 2 to 4 C, 35 to 39 Fahrenheit. 
My kids are bummed, but Portland shuts down if there's even a tiny bit of snow. Q eye rolling. A follow-up to TWIV 421 when you read my letter. Thanks. About the first co-authored paper of Adam, Abat- Adam Abate and, um, and eyes. <laughs> That's a new possessive. <laughs> okay. Um, so, the, yeah, Ken and Adam, I guess, had the co-authorship. Uh, is to be published as a bump from TWIV 195. They did it in the hot tub. The first paper is published in the Open Access Virology Journal, not Biomed Journal, Kathy, published by Biomed Central. Uh, gives a link to the article. Unfortunately, we were not able to get the publisher to add a TWIV bump acknowledgement retroactively. Mm-hmm. However, our second manuscript was just accepted and the uncorrected proof released behind a paywall, unfortunately, in Journal of Virological Methods. Since it is behind a paywall, it might be harder for listeners to read that uh, we did an acknowledgement of the TWIV bump in press. Mm, nice. Mm. How many of those have there been so far? Mm-hmm. Too many. Unfortunately, we cited the old twiv.tv website, but we'll correct that to microbe.tv stroke twiv in the proof. <laughs> Disc. Cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, both papers follow somewhat your recent technology arc. Adam is a physicist at UCSF who has developed some really cool technology for virus and other macromolecule microfluidic sorting of water in oil droplets based on DNA sequence. Hmm. This is like a flow cytometer cell sorter that uses nucleic acid sequence instead of antibody binding for sorting, allowing, as Adam calls it, high throughput biology. That sounds like a very cool technology. I'm not sure I'm in love with the term, but uh, another way of putting it is finally is finding a really small needle in a really big haystack. Our two papers are proof of principle for host cell sorting, second paper, and virus sorting, first paper. Adam contacted me out of the blue after hearing TWIV 195 to basically say, we have some technology you might be interested in. How about a collaboration? He suggested trying to apply his technology to find the host for our hot tub virus. Still working on that. Stay tuned. Adam would be a great person to talk to on TWIV. Very cool technology, interesting history, and great guy. Or maybe I have to start a podcast on Phage and have him as a guest. Mm Mm-hmm. The final supplemental figure of our uh, JVIRL methods paper has a picture of the setup we used for our experiments. Who knew that an optical bench would be needed for virology research? Thanks for all the great podcasts, conversation, etc. Also, a huge thanks to Dixon for putting his parasitic diseases text online. I just started a project on soil transmitted helminths, nice. but that is another story for another day, perhaps on TWIP. You bet. All the best for the rest of 2017. Cool. Very nice. So, Look at you, Dixon. Hey. So that's a that's a twiv bump, an acknowledgement of a twiv bump, and a collaboration that grew out of twiv. Yep. There you go. People, more people need to listen. More collaborations, yeah. more productivity. There you go. Okay, I um I released a ASM released a video this week of an interview I did with Harmeet Malik, and it was making the way around Facebook, and someone posted, "Who the hell has thirty minutes to watch that?" And I was thinking, 30 minutes, are you kidding? Right. What, you, you want two hours? <laughs> or he could try the, um, what's that history podcast that I listened to? Uh, let's see. It's, uh, everyone knows the answer. Come on. Come on. Hardcore history. Hardcore history. They can be four hours long. Right. Well, I mean, the actual history took a lot longer than that. But so. I enjoy them because so, I, I have a long commute. Your next project is the Reader's Digest version of TWIV. <laughs> or well, you could got, do it as a tachistoscope. Actually, actually, Vincent has short uh, virus videos online now. Right. Yeah. I also could make the bathroom version, right? All right. <laughs> I, someone gave me once this thing where you're supposed to read in the bathroom short versions of long books. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's totally ridiculous. <laughs> Let me call Rich Condi. Here we are. Here we are. Oh, he's yep. here. Hi, Rich. Hey. Hello there, Rich. Hey, Rich. Hello, Dixon. Hi, Alan. Okay, sorry I'm late, guys. It's all right. What's the weather uh, like down there? Oh, man. Do we have to talk about it? <laughs> is it raining? Snowing. No, it's not raining. But get this. It is like 2.20 in the afternoon in Austin, Texas, and it is 32 degrees. <laughs> zero, zero C and overcast. There you go. A couple go. of days ago, it was 75 and sunny, and it's supposed to be, it's going down to the mid to low 20s tonight, and it's going to be freezing for another couple of days and then back up to 75. Oh. It's not boring, <clears throat> but as I said, for this Florida it's, boy, it's a little offensive because I know it's going to be, it's going to be stinking hot during the summer. Okay. <laughs> it ought to be beautiful all winter long. Well, now I think you have it's an ex- probably 
<laughs> you think you live in pretty, San Diego? <laughs> yeah. I think it's pretty cold in uh, perhaps Florida now because I know people in Athens were talking about possible snow. Mm. Well, so. I, I, uh, um, I hesitate to look at the weather in Florida, you know, because <laughs> usually it frustrates me. At any rate, deal with Welcome. just deal with it. Just deal with it. It's Rich, all right. Rich, we yeah, have an we have an in studio guest, Jared. I, I heard I heard an in studio voice. Yep. Yeah. Or I heard I heard another voice. Who who who? My name's Jared Rice, and I want to know why you need any more excuse than to hustle yourself down to Franklin's for some of that barbecue in Austin than a cold day. Oh, okay. <laughs> Franklin's? Yeah. Okay. Write it down. He likes to watch the bats at uh, sunset, is it? Or is it sunrise? I'm talking to have me? a paper here that yeah, you. goes with something like that. You have bats yeah. in Austin. Uh, appropriate segue. Yeah, we, we do. We do. Yes. We have a bat paper, but before we get to uh, bat paper, we're going to talk about diarrhea. Uh-huh. Oh, great. How I pleasant. Figured, <laughs> we figured, you know, after the holidays, it's a good thing. Wow, I can't wait. That's right. This is wonderful. That's what everybody with diarrhea, <laughs> diarrhea says, too. I love it. <laughs> yeah. This is a uh, paper published in M. Bio. Wait a, minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I missed. Can you give me a 10 word summary of Jared's bio? What, what's this? What's no, going ask on? Ask him. Ask him. What would you like to know? Hi, Jared. Hi. Who are you? I'm Jared C. Rice. <laughs> I'm an undergraduate at the College of Charleston, uh, trying to get my Bachelor's of Science in Molecular Biology and Biomedical Physics. And okay. Vincent and the clan here have decided, much to their error, to let me on the radio. <laughs> let me tell you, you have the radio voice. Does <laughs> Wait, does okay. he ever? Yeah. Okay. It's so an well, FM radio voice. I'm it's, it's, it's a not late a night, it's late night FM. FM radio. And, and you know, yeah. oddly enough, I have a face made for radio too. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. <laughs> Nobody sees us ever. Well, sometimes they do. All right. Okay. Good. So he's in New York, and he come. He came to the uh, tourist destination that is exactly the right. Twib Studio. It's like visiting right. Thirty Rock. Yep, Thirty Rock. All right. Now, Rich Condit. Now that you have a home. I'm going to send you a microphone, et cetera, so you can sound excellent. excellent also. I understand that Kathy has sent me a boom. I haven't seen it yet, Kathy. Yep. Hopefully, Might get there today. Hopefully you can use it. All right. The first paper published in MBio, it's, it's labeled an observation, which is interesting. And I figured that would make a good snippet. It's called Oral Administration of Astrovirus Capsid Protein is Sufficient to Induce Acute Diarrhea in Vivo. And, and that's the observation. That's it. You could actually, <laughs> this could be the ultimate snippet. Say no more, say yes. no more. But we'll talk about it a little bit. This comes from the lab of Stacy Schultz Cherry, who, of course, has been on TWIV several times. She's at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. And there are other authors. The first author is Victoria Meliopoulos. And then we have Marvin Frieden, Moser, Nigo, Ali Blixlager. Reddy Vari, Heath, Kosi, and, Cher- and Stacy. Matthew Kosi, the second to last. I don't know. It sounds familiar. I have a feeling he may have written a letter to Twiv at some point. Anyway, uh, St. Jude's, University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, North Carolina State University collaboration here. Astroviruses. The reason I picked this, it's, kind of, it's an interesting observation. Uh, and uh, we don't, I don't think we've talked much about astroviruses, save when Stacy was on. Um, TWIV at ASV many years ago. Leading causes of gastroenteritis in children under two years of age and also immunocompromised people and older adults like Dixon. Older now is over 70, Dixon. Yeah, well, I'm still, I fit into that category. And yeah, we, but you're not, an, you're not an adult, Dixon, so I think you're going to be a <laughs> This is all true. <laughs> Excellent. Astroviruses, a, to- a term coined by Madley and Cosgrove in 1975. Because astron means star in Greek. They were round viruses with a distinctive five- or six-pointed star-like appearance. Originally observed by direct electron microscopy in stools of infants hospitalized with diarrhea. And these particles were... Astro has nothing to do with the part of the body affected. No. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for that. Oh, I got it. I finally got it. Boy. Uh, they isolated the virus in 1981, were able to grow it in culture. It's a small, round, RNA-containing uh, virus with a single open reading frame. 
Now, Dixon, do you know another virus <laughs> family that has a single open reading frame? Should I exp- <laughs> I'll give you a hint. I probably do, but I've forgotten. I'll give you a yeah, hint. I would guess. Wait. We have a guess from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I have a gentleman in the audience. <laughs> uh, Single? Uh, Single open reading frame? Mm, those are, uh, yeah, they do have open reading frames on each segment, but they're segmented. Oh, silly man. Yeah, but that's okay. It's it's really... It's it was, close. Yeah. It was a, it was a uh, question trying to get Dixon to say coronaviruses, but he didn't. Almost. Almost. I, I, I was leaning in that direction. But what I'd like to know about this one is, does it involve the G protein at all? The G protein? Yeah. You mean GTP? Like a VPG? Well, G there is protein? a G protein that uh, is a gatekeeper for uh, diarrheal diseases. And you mean like G protein coupled receptors? That's the one. Yeah. We okay. don't know, actually. We'll get because cholera some. has a way of dealing. Yeah, with Yeah, that. that's, that's true. We don't actually know. So I wondered if a single protein can do it. Is it anything like cholera toxin? There are a couple of host proteins involved in maintaining a barrier. We'll talk about, but okay. not as far as I know. Right. Uh, three open reading frames, single stranded plus sense RNA genomes, and the genome encodes this non-structural proteins, the RNA polymerase of the virus, and the capsid protein, single capsid protein, and th- you can get these from humans, but also other animals as well. Um, there, as you'll see in this paper, there's a turkey astrovirus, <laughs> which is wonderful. And this this work in this paper is done in Turkey. And if you look on uh, uh, Viral Zone, there's a bovine astrovirus, chicken, duck, feline. Is this got economic importance for that? <clears throat> and mamastrovirus. Good I, question, a whole Dixon. Slug of those. Good question. Yeah, what you would? It's possible. I don't know the answer. Do. Avian astroviruses have economic relevance to turkeys, chickens. Those are the main ones, right, Dixon? Yes. And did, and did you say that it's a single protein? I mean, the whole capsid is a single protein? Yes, sir. So it's a crystallized protein, basically. No, it's a single protein. Now, I understand. Crystals but it's have nothing multiple to do with copies of that yeah. single protein. Right, and they're folded in so, certain ways to make this uh, mm-hmm. impervious. Yeah. So That's Dixon. Very interesting, yes. The smallest Capsids can be made of a single protein repeated okay. 60 times. Right. One protein repeated 60 times will make a capsid like the one on the desk in front of you, which I left to your <laughs> edification. You Does, can, the, are they self-assembling? If yeah, you have a course. solution of them, they would just form the capsids Absolutely. right away, right? Yeah, they don't, need any, they don't need RNA to assemble. Right. The information's all there. Anyway, uh, here uh, there has been previous suggestion that... Um, Capsid protein alone is enough to make uh, intest- differentiated intestinal epithelial cells uh, lose their barrier functions, disrupt tight junctions, and so forth. So they simply ask here if we feed turkey poults. Is that how you say it? Poults or poults? Poults. poults. That, that's a young turkey? Poults. As in yes. poultry. Mm-hmm. That's right. young. Mm-hmm. I think it's a young, just about any kind of poultry, isn't it? Exactly. Five-day-old commercial turkey poults. Right. And they gave them... Purified capsid protein. Now, they say recombinant capsid protein. So it was produced and purified, and they give 0 to 50 micrograms orally, and the control is just saline. And then they monitor them for diarrhea. Every day they go into the coop and they say, how are you doing today? Are you in the coop to look for poop? <laughs> so, Dixon, if if the turkeys cannot tell you what's wrong with them, what is yes. that called? Is uh, that a sign or a symptom? If they can't tell you and you can look and see for yourself, it's a sign. And if they could tell you, what would it be? It would be remarkable because turkeys can't (laughs) talk. (laughs) Very good, Dixon. Very good. (laughs) If turkeys could talk. If turkeys could talk, put that as the title. (laughs) Could be. It could be. They scored for diarrhea using a clinical scoring chart. (laughs) And so they got diarrhea in a dose-dependent manner. Low amounts, 10 to 15 micrograms of the capsid protein. Very little diarrhea. PBS, no diarrhea. But 30 and 50 micrograms, they get diarrhea. What kind of diarrhea? Not bloody. No, no. Uh, Upper GI or lower GI? Oh, there's a, there's a terrific supplementary figure here uh, <laughs> really? that shows, <laughs> that, that describes, shows you uh, what they use for their clinical scoring system. Mm-hmm. They got four different categories of poop from... On the one end, 
for one, dry, well-formed, and light brown, up to number four, completely liquid, runny, and dark brown. Yeah. We got nice nice pictures of each. This might make a good episode. <laughs> Parasitologists are quite used to all of that. Dry, what did you say? Dry, well-formed? Dry, well-formed, and light brown. Light, light brown. This that's is our title. A, that's our title. If you're a turkey, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay. That's it. And then so when Dixon, they re- does that tell you whether it's upper or lower? No, it doesn't because uh, <clears throat> it actually has to do with hypersecretion and the, um, mm. yeah, like for instance, cryptosporidium is a, a, a protozoan that causes an upper GI level secretion diarrhea that results in watery stool. I mean, it's just, it doesn't look like uh, any kind of a diarrheal episode whatsoever. Right. Same with cholera. Cholera, um, produces a watery stool that eventually results in the sloughing of all those epithelial cells from the GI tract. So, But lower down, you have uh, diarrheal diseases in, induced by, let's say, intermebia histolytica, for instance. That's a, a protozoan. Uh, but I'm sure there are lower GI tract viruses also that induce a different kind than you would get if you had uh, infected the upper GI tract. So mm-hmm. in, in either place, it depends on... Uh, what where the fluids are coming from as to what the consistency of the diarrhea will be. But it's going to be very different for birds, which absolutely, have a absolutely. very different digestive tract no and a kind no of cloaca. Um, but, yeah. Dixon, how's your cloaca? <laughs> <laughs> it's cloaking as, as we speak. <laughs> so this is a diarrhea in these uh, pults that was finished by 72 hours. Yeah. So recovered. And... Um, they did some biopsies and looked at these, the intestinal epithelium, and the protein was localized to the apical membrane of enterocytes. Sure. So, yeah, those are bipolar cells. You know about these. Um, they have two different sides to them. <laughs> right. So one side is the basement. We call that. that um, no, no, really. They're called. They're called uh, what's polarity? the they're polarity? Polarity. Polarized cells. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Polarized cells. I don't know. Bipolar. I like, bi- I like bipolar. <laughs> <laughs> crazy, <laughs> crazy cells. Crazy cells. Right. Yeah. So these attach to the microfilter surface. Yeah. Right. Yes. And, and do so they, do the villi flatten? Uh, they don't say that. No. Okay. Although in some, you know, other viruses can cause gastroenteritis, noroviruses and right. rotaviruses, right? Sure. And they. There you see flattening, yeah, and then recovery afterwards, mm-hmm. but they don't mention that here. So but this is only a protein. That's just a virus. protein. There's no replication, exactly. right? Exactly. Right. And that's probably why they recover quickly, right? Yeah, there's no replication. that's right. Does, does poliovirus cause a diarrheal disease? Oh, no. This is a good question. I was going to, at some point, say, what's the purpose of inducing diarrhea uh, by these viruses? And I'm sure that someone would have said to spread better to other hosts, and that's in which I would say, yeah. no, no, it's not anthropomorphizing. Yeah. It's to it's to facilitate spread because if you induce explosive diarrhea, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. you could imagine that that uh, could facilitate spread. But polio does wonderful spread, highly efficient spread without any diarrhea. Exactly. Right. So I don't know. It may be a side effect of some aspect of yeah, yeah. you know replication. The capsid obviously can do this. So. Yep. Well, and, and they just, point out it's it's just to make you miserable. That's all. <laughs> right. How did it get the nickname summer diarrhea? Let's see. I'll look it up here. What pa- I closed the book. What page was I on? Does anyone remember? I, I, I know it's in here. Astroviruses. Page no, no, no. Not it's... astrovirus. No, I no, meant it's... polio. Summer polio, diarrhea? I was... No, I never yeah, heard no, that. No, no. In all the years I've oh, okay. worked on it, I've never heard that. <laughs> okay. Mm. Um, so they mention um, in the paper that rotavirus also has um, a, a toxin, an enterotoxin. And doesn't norovirus have something like this as well? Mm-hmm. Uh, there are there are questions about this. There's that's right. There's uh, it's being investigated. There is some um, suspicion that I think, in fact, one of the minor capsid proteins. Uh, okay. One of the minor yeah. minor capsid proteins, I believe, is uh, uh, suspected right. to be. Have enterotoxin-like properties. Okay, so so we have uh, examples. We have examples of rotavirus where it's pretty clearly an enterotoxin, and norovirus where we suspect there's an enterotoxin. So it would not be unprecedented for an for an intestinal virus to have evolved some mechanism that seems to exist solely to induce diarrhea. Right, right, but polio doesn't. Polio doesn't. And right, it no, transmits. I'm going back on, I'm back on. Astrovirus. Transmits very well. So uh, that's. Yes. Interesting. Uh, this so uh, an, an enterotoxin is is rare in the virus world. Yes. You know when it was first found with rotas, 
was unusual because bacteria have them left and right, all sure. kinds of toxins right. they produce, but not much in, back, in viruses. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they are. But here it's a capsid, so obviously it's got more than one function. And maybe the diarrhea is an accident. It's an accident of the binding <laughs> so to, to the speak. wrong. It's binding. It's, it's binding the wrong. Unpreventable uh, accident. There, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? A couple of interesting controls. They digest the capsid with proteinase K. Does not, of course, it causes much less diarrhea, more like uh, the controls. There and was another control I wanted them to do, yeah. which is to boil it. Boil it. Okay. Yeah, do that. Because uh, if you digest it with proteinase K and it doesn't do it, that tells, tells you, you know, that it's, it's it, a protein. it requires some, right. some integrity. But I don't know yeah. if this capsid protein express as it does actually forms into a capsid-like structure or not. Mm. If, you, if it did and you boiled it, it ought to be a random coil. And that'll tell you whether it's uh, maybe a linear epitope or mm-hmm. something right. more structured. Well, the other thing you can do is segment off the protein and see which yeah, portion sure. induces it, right? Mm-hmm. Assuming right. it's not folding in a exactly, way that exactly, which is why I was so going Dixon, back to the G protein. Uh, how how uh, how small a piece would you like to cut it into? Thirds. Thirds. Yeah, yeah. we'll start with half. Okay. You know, and then thirds, and then quarters, and then eventually the other the other control, which I was thinking of early in the paper, and they actually did it, is uh, they they fed these turkeys purified recombinant human astrovirus capsid protein. Right. Ah. And they did not. The turkey poults did not develop diarrhea. Look at that. Mm-hmm. Maybe because it can't bind to the intestine. Maybe. Right. Who knows why, but that's yep. a nice control. Yep. Uh, then they do a little bit of work on trying to understand how this is working. Yes. And they showed before in, in polarized cell cultures that the capsid protein increases barrier permeability Right, so you know you have to have a barrier in the intestine to prevent uh, you losing important things and not not, not having hey, fluids, m- <laughs> fluids <probably. laughs> like, yeah, among them. Yeah, so they get like the, the contents of your intestine. Contents uh, that's of your right, intestine. That's, that's, right, that's, that's right. right. So sec- they took sections of small intestine from the pults yeah, get that got either PBS or the capsid protein. They put them in chambers. They monitor transepithelial resistance as a measurement of barrier permeability. They find right. the capsid protein markedly reduces barrier function, and there is no inflammation or cell damage here, Dixon. They note right. that. So they could have also done a theri fistula. A theri fistula. Yep. It's an exteriorization of yeah, the small intestine. Yeah, they do intestine. that in rabbits for what? Cholera? Lots of different things. Yeah, yeah. that's right. They take a piece of the intestine out and they inoculate that's right. it. That's right. And that it's, gives them access to it, right? Exactly right. Hmm. Exactly yeah, it's uh, that's or a fluorescent uh, G fluorescent protein on the capsid itself to see if they could cytolocalize it someplace. Mm. You seem to have a knowledge of diarrhea, Dixon. I do because trichinella causes an extreme diarrhea, actually. Yeah. So, ah. a lot of things do it. Anyway, they say that uh, this is nice, but it's not enough probably to cause diarrhea. The other things have to happen as well. One of them is um, that you can interfere with. Um, brush border functional proteins. There are two of them that they look at. One is called a sodium hydrogen exchanger 3, which is important for diarrhea caused by tumor necrosis factor alpha. Mm. And they also look at the sodium glucose transporter 1, mm. and that is targeted by uh, rotavirus. It inhibits SGLT1 activity. So um, they find that NHE3, the sodium hydrogen exchanger, um, is increased in cytoplasmic fractions, and it uh, seems to be relocalized in um, in the intestinal cells. And they show a picture here showing the relocalization, although I, I don't know where it's going. They don't actually describe where it's relocalized to. It's different, but I don't know where it is and what it means. So there's some changes in these transporter proteins. And these are important for maintaining homeostatic balance as well. Do they well. know what the receptor for the virus is? No, they is? don't. They don't. I, it could be that it's binding the receptor <laughs> yeah, and doing exactly. this, right, Dixon? Exactly. And this is causing these changes. You bet. So that's basically the observation. Because we know a lot about the gut and its receptors because of the physiology of the gut and the interest in nutrition. And so a lot of things are known about mm. the kinds of processes that gut cells can uh, facilitate. Right, and uh, so this the, they have a, a wealth of, of tools mm-hmm. that they mm-hmm. could apply to their problem when they. Um, I'm, I'm sure they are define it more carefully. 
They yes. they suggest that sodium malabsorption is part of uh, the the reason why the sodium malabsorption sodium malabsorption, okay. but not sugars. Um, it might be, but they say sodium because the transporter proteins that they looked at that were changed in their locations mm-hmm. are sodium transporters. Mm-hmm. Uh, relocalization of sodium transporters away from the plasma membrane. Disruption of fluid and electrolyte transport leads to a net loss of liquid in the intestine and subsequent diarrhea. Right. Does that make sense to you, Dixon? It does. So that's like a hypersecretion. If the sodium mm-hmm. is on the outside, the water tries to neutralize the osmolality of right. it. And right. It never succeeds because there's no way to get the sodium so you have too inside. much sodium in the lumen. That's right. So the, the water comes out of the intestine. Yeah. yeah. And then you get diarrhea. It's like swallowing a glass full of Epsom salts. <laughs> <laughs> you've had a well, colonoscopy in salt yeah of course you, that's, you what they swallow, give you. that's what they give you high salt right they do and that cleans and you, you out you can feel it rushing through your whole digestive tract you certainly sac, can and that causes diarrhea because the water comes out of the cells to exactly. try and exactly. oh interesting exactly. now I know exactly what happens you got it okay yep. Any anyone else uh, I, I have two comments it's yes. back on the polio thing so uh, I was trying to figure out where I heard the summer diarrhea thing, but I did find that there's a book entitled The Summer Plague, Mm -hmm. and it relates to the, you know, kids not being allowed to go swimming because, you know, it was thought that that's where they were getting polio and so forth. And then somehow, even related to that, I found a paper called Diarrhea as a Minor Adverse Effect Due to Oral Polio Vaccine. So this is a study in Japan and they see approximately 10% of the patients get a mild diarrhea closely related to the administration of the OPV. Mm. Fascinating. I'm not sure it's causative, <laughs> but at least an association. So as an aside, <laughs> yes. I moved from California to the East Coast in 1951. And the summer of 1951. You lived in California? I did, up until 1950. I didn't know this. And then moved to the East Coast with mm-hmm. my family, of course. And there was a swimming pool in Dumont called the Dumont <laughs> Swimming Pool of all things. And it was open, and I went, and I loved it, and the next year they closed it. So what to do in the summer, right? And that's when I started to take up fishing. <laughs> they closed it because of polio? Yeah, they did. Yeah. They did, actually. Wow. They did. So, Kathy, in nature, wild polio is largely asymptomatic, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 90% of infections have no symptoms, so that's why, mm-hmm. you know, there may be a little bit of diarrhea and, and other things, you know, a stiff neck, a headache, but mm-hmm. um, it's nothing like these uh, intestinal viruses that, oh, right. that right. They cause diarrhea a lot, and I just never understood the difference. It's an interesting question anyway. All right, that is our snippet. We also have a paper, which I thought was interesting, because it deals with white nose syndrome. And um, this was published in PLOS Pathogens using a novel partiti virus in pseudo gymnoascus destructans to understand the epidemiology of white nose syndrome. This is from Marilyn Rusink's lab at Penn State. The authors are Vascar Thapa, Turner, Hafenstein, Overton, and Vanderwolf. They've also collaborated with um, uh, oh boy. He's a beast with those surnames. Uh, I, well, I take great pleasure in pronouncing names that I can't pronounce. Sounds like a law firm from here. <laughs> Unless they're Italian, in which case, <laughs> Reduvido, which is not Italian. <laughs> I do like to pronounce. You do like Reduvido. I, I've noticed that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not good at pronouncing a, a lot well, That of was words, pretty good, but, though, Vincent. Uh, I thought it was nice. Uh, so they're mostly from Pennsylvania, but different places in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, they've got uh, one col- at least one collaborator in Canada. Really? A? Eh? Mm-hmm. Hey, yeah. yeah, New Brunswick. New Brunswick. Okay. Hey, that's right. Okay, Pseudogymnoascus destructans, previously Geomyces destructans, but I just love the species name, destructans. Destructans. Mm. It's a fungal and p- that is what it is doing. You bet. Fungal pathogen yep. causes right nose syndrome in hibernating bats, but this is in North America. Yes, yes. Uh, over 5 million bats have died since uh, in... We've noted disease in 2006, which happened here in New York State. Right, Dixon? Right. Do you know uh, anything about this disease, Dixon? I know a little bit. but I, I, I follow the literature a little bit um, because of the association of bats with vector control. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, bats love eating insects. Most of the bats that uh, live around here are insectivores. And um, 
they eat mosquitoes, among other things. So this hits hibernating bats. Yes. And it's been found in 29 right. states in That's the right. U.S., five provinces in Canada. Now, here's the thing. Not in Europe. Not in Europe or in Asian bats, even though yes. the fungus is widely yeah. distributed in Europe right. and parts That's of right. China. No mass mortality. So what's up? Right. What's up? That's it. <laughs> and the, the impact of it in North America has been absolutely appalling. Correct. Mm. It's just, they, they mentioned in the paper, it's known to have killed over 5 million bats. Yeah. And it's just wiped out entire hibernacula and, and right. areas that used to have bats no longer have them. They're just vanishing. I love that word. Hibernacula? Hibernacula, yes. <laughs> Simulacrum. It Wait, sounds like that. Does it? Dracula <laughs> live in a hibernacula? Hibernaculum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be another show title if we. I love it. hibernaculum. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, they, re- they look at whether viruses are involved in this paper because mycoviruses, which infect fungi, are known to modulate fungal pathogenesis. They can make uh, fungi more or less pathogenic. In fact, there's a famous one. Of uh, the chestnut blight fungus, oh, yeah. right? And Don that's Lusk. a virus mediated pathogen. Yeah, there's a virus of wow. the chestnut blight that mo- modulates the pathogenesis. I don't know. And you know, Don Nuss has worked on this for many years, and right. I've asked him. He doesn't want to come on Twiv. He says he's too scared. Uh, really? Yeah, said, Are we that said, intimidating? Said, Kathy is too hard with her questions. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy's come on. She's I, a gentle... I would contact him ahead of time, and you know we could just chat casually. And yeah, well, I did. I went up to him at ASV, and uh, said, "I'd love to have you on Twitter. This is a cool story." And he said, "No, no, no, I, I can't do that." I was, okay. And then uh, a year later, I said, "Why, why can't uh, you do it?" He said, "I'm just too scared." Is it a double stranded RNA virus also? Right, it is talking about Donald so Nuss. yeah, it what? is a double stranded RNA. So virus. you know, yeah. you look through the pathogens, and protozoans have double stranded RNA viruses mm-hmm. as well, and some of those are also mediators of pathogens. Yeah, that's right. They can make the infection how humans worth. Yeah, how remarkable. All right, so they took they they looked for this virus in uh, North American and European bats. Sixty two isolates of PD, which we'll call Pseudogymnoascus destructans, PD from North. Uh, American European bats, and they look for mycoviruses. Um, four North American and one European species of bats collected from 2008 to 2015, and they had them in the U in the North America from all over Pennsylvania, New York, West Virginia, North Carolina, Vermont, Ohio, et cetera, et cetera, and Canada. Mm-hmm. Then they had some from Czech Republic, Slovakia. They found double stranded RNA in all the North American isolates, and in particular, they ran gels which is why I thought everyone would love this because they have yes. classical molecular biology. They run gels and they see two double-stranded RNA bands. Now, Jared is listening attentively because oh, so. finally there's something that connects with an undergraduate level a course. Gel. Oh, well, <laughs> That's not, right. Not, not entirely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was more or less wondering, this might be a question for um, a mycologist, if there in the case of this, uh, the pathogenicity of this fungus, if there were ways to inhibit that um, hypho anastomosis, is that, is that the term I'm looking for? Hypho anastomosis, that, that fusion of branching of, hypha, of hyphae that causes reticulating networks, is there a way to inhibit that and completely eradicate the pathogenicity of this fungus? Well, remember, it's uh, only. It's only in North American isolates, so we don't know why. So, yeah, do we know what the actual pathogenicity is of the fungus? No, I mean, I don't think they've done that experiment here, right? First of all, as we'll see, it's really hard to cure the fungus of the virus, and right. they did not infect polyethylene glycol. Right. So did, yeah. did we mention <laughs> that they, they, found this, <laughs> they found this in all the North American isolates and none of the European isolates? Well, that's, that's remarkable. That's right. Correct. Yeah. That's so the, they, have a, they have a more limited sampling of the European isolates but nevertheless that's yeah they're mostly they're mostly very, from the czech republic and we yeah, should say yeah it seems like a smoking gun or not quite a smoking gun oh yeah but i mean it's just it seems like i thought that's where the whole paper was going to go but it didn't so they were very so. circumspect in the yeah. yes. discussion vincent did they you do say everything that? but come out and say well maybe yeah they, they didn't say that, say that. Right. No. you said they got this data from a jill 
Yeah, they Is that initially like a bat out of gel. <laughs> bat out of gel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, Dixon, look at <laughs> no, gels. I, I can see it. Nice bands. Yeah, um, gels are my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they say now. Remember, if you just take, if you just do the extraction procedure on, um, on uninfected plants or fungi, they don't have detectable amounts of double stranded. Uh, RNA, certainly not high molecular weight stuff. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, over a KB in length. So the presence of double-stranded RNA of this size is an indicator of the viral genome. So they sequenced these uh, RNAs. They made cDNA, and they did... Oh, and here's another one, Sanger sequencing. Whoa! Look at this! Oh. Get back. Old stuff. A, T, G, C, hike! Got a gel around here. I just <laughs> found the other day. What did I do with it? Is it somewhere. Wow. kept it because I have like only one gel left from those days. Anyway, so this is a known, it, it's related to known viruses. It is, uh, it's a new virus though, but it's related to uh, known double-stranded RNA viruses. They call it Pseudogymnoascus destructans partiti virus dash PA. That's a mouthful. D- Dixon, you know what yes. the PA stands for? PA, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So PDPVPA. PDPVPA. <laughs> it's closely, it's closest similarity to a virus from Penicillium stoloniferum, which mm-hmm. of course is also a fungus. And a facultative pathogen. Is that right? Yep. They did mention that in the article. It's facultative a pathogen. It can induce lung infections. Mm. So, and that virus, Penicillium virus, is the type species of the genus Gamma partiti virus in the family partiti viridae. Hmm. But it's a new virus, this one that they've pulled out of uh, uh, PD. So when they look around, Vincent, (laughs) I'm sure you're going to get to this, um, how much variation in that virus do you find throughout the North American venue? Ah! So that's a good good question. question. That's a good question. We can skip to that. We'll skip. I'm slowly accumulating knowledge here, kids. (laughs) But that is that is exactly where this paper is headed. They they sequenced all these North American isolates. Forty-five. And if you compare the capsid protein sequence, yeah. the nucleotide sequence of the capsid protein, right. the 45 isolates cluster into two major clades okay. based on their geographic distribution. You have one clade or the Canadian isolates there you go. and the other U.S. isolates. How about that? The idea being that these are separate introductions at some point of the virus that then ah. diversified independently, and that's why you would see two different now, biological microviruses, genes. most microviruses don't... Um, do a whole lot of transmission laterally they're passed down right mm, that's correct yeah so right. they're the, uh, they are the, vi- the, mm. vi- the virus particles don't real don't exit the cell yeah that's right right uh, they stay inside the cells and they're Interesting. Uh, passed along through cell division so it's mm-hmm. vertically right. so this so this ends up being um mm. a genetically fairly stable thing because it's got the mutation rate of the host basically it's it's the same virus being passed down from one generation to the next in P. destructans. And that allows them to trace these trees across um, all these generations. Well, of course, these these do have RNA polymerases, these viruses. They do, yes. So there's going to be a mutation rate. So so I would say the mutation rate is determined by that, not by the host. Okay. Okay. Not having to go outside (laughs) does take away some selection, yeah. Right. It's going to slow down the growth of it in any case. So yeah. what what is the hypothesis regarding how this virus actually got involved in this fungus? Oh, they don't know. They don't Anybody know. Do you have any guesses? I would I would just speculate that this um, uh, you've got it closely related to a penicillium virus. Yeah. Uh, and I believe P. destructans is uh, also may have like a soil life cycle. Mm-hmm. Well, it's an ascomycete. I think you're right. Um, it's an ascomycete, right? Right, so so and you've got these fungi that can live in mm-hmm. the soil mm-hmm. and that can be facultative pathogens, and at some point, this some strain of P. destructans picked up this virus, probably from another species of fungus. Yeah. And if I were going to go way out on a speculative limb, which the authors, uh, as we've commented, have been very, very careful <laughs> not to do this, uh, and I don't know if that was in the original manuscript <laughs> and uh, removed, but um, but you know one rather obvious possibility is that that then opened up a new niche for P. destructans, which is causing white nose syndrome. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. That's not entirely outrageous. No, not at no, it's not. It, that that all that is all speculation, but it's um, could be sure. So, do bats hibernate because of changes in temperature or because of changes in seasons? Hmm. So the southern brown-tailed bat, I don't know whether that would be, um, or the Latin American bat, or it could escape from this infection because they don't hibernate. Of course, Maybe. as you know, Dixon, not all bats hibernate. Well, that's another thing. But those that do usually live at high latitudes where insect prey becomes scarce during yeah, sure, cold months. Sure, sure. So yeah. even the same species at a different latitude would not hibernate versus would hibernate. Is yeah. that true? Right. So there's okay. always a reserve of bats to fill in the dead bats that died off the year before that. So, you know, you're worried about what's going to happen to bats altogether. And I see a lot of people in the neighborhood where I go fishing. They put out these bat hotels hoping that they will come back because there's a ton of mosquitoes there in the summertime and they they want some control measures here that don't involve insecticides. And um, they've actually asked me about this once or twice. You know, what's the story with this white nose syndrome? And I, I didn't have any answers, of course, because I, I wasn't as familiar as I am now having, having read this paper. So it's a great thing that you've brought this up. I, we have bats uh, in our backyard in the summer at dusk. I love watching them yeah. flitter, flitter around. Yep. It's so cool. Yep, they are. It's just cool. We actually put a bat hotel in, and squirrels went in it. And <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's right. So if you look at the sequence of this virus, you can see an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, uh, putative capsid protein as well. They also look in mycelia, and they can see by electron microscopy uh, isometric particles, 30 nanometers in diameter, which would be about the right size for the partiti viridi. And they can also extract double-stranded RNA from purified virus particles to kind of close the gap there. Yeah. Uh, then they try and cure the um, the fungus of infection. They tried a lot of different things, but uh, didn't they, most of them didn't work well. The, as soon as they tried growing the fungus, the virus reappeared. But polyethylene glycol... Uh, was the key they were able to, and that is my understanding that this affects water availability, yeah. depending on how much you use. Right. Yeah, I think of polyethylene glycol as kind of sucking up water. Yeah. I don't know if that's true or not, but and so they were. Uh, and to, speaking of, of diarrhea, yes, okay, <laughs> right. Polyethylene glycol is another <laughs> method of cleaning you out. I'll say it's what you put in your car too. Yeah, oh, that's, yep. that's, that's ethylene glycol. Oh, that's, that's ethylene. No, that's ethylene. That's not ethylene glycol will kill you. Yes. Yes. So poly is not a polyethylene glycol is a it's polymer not absorbed, that it just goes on uh, through and yeah. it sucks not, up the water. Not, that's not an antifreeze. Huh? No. Interesting. And polyethylene is it? glycol is also used to. I, we used to use it all the time to precipitate phage when we were doing phage yeah. prep, or to fuse cells together. No wonder my car is over Or to fuse cells. It's yeah. what we use to uh, precipitate mouse adenovirus. Look at this. So yeah. that we can concentrate it. Oh, it's yeah, the universal right. reagent. But, but so they were is... able to treat the fungus with PEG, and they get rid of the virus below the detection limit. Mm -hmm. And um, these isolates, the fungi look different. They, they appear white. After mm -hmm. losing yes. the virus, they lost the characteristic gray pigmentation of wild type and appeared white. They produced significantly less conidia. Right. Which is the right. sexual stage of that fungus. And so um, they say that clearly the virus is tightly associated with the fungal isolates from North America. Interesting. And gives them a phenotype. Yeah, it does. A phenotype you know, that yeah. could fit in with the idea that this is providing some kind of advantage. Mm. Uh, an interesting point came up earlier. and I, You know, if I were writing this paper, I might be less circumspect. Yeah. You wonder if they if they weren't more out there in an earlier draft and the reviewer right. says, no, no, no. Well, they go at it kind of from the side. They they talk about how mycoviruses have, you know, caused phenotypes on virulence. Um they but they're but they're very cautious. They say, you know, our, our sample size in Europe isn't big, so right. we want to be careful about that. Right. Uh, so are we taking bets? Oh uh, boy. No, I don't I'll think bet, so. I don't I'll bet the so. virus does it. I'll bet you the virus does it. Makes it pathogenic. There you go. There's your title. I got nothing to lose, you know. I got <laughs> <laughs> Particularly now that you live in Texas. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's what they say. This is the key paragraph. We have not explored the roles of the virus 
in white nose syndrome, but some indirect evidence, including difficulties in curing the fungus of the virus, stability of the virus after numerous generations of cultures, changes in pigmentation, changes in canidia production, indicate close biological relationships between the fungus and the virus. Hence, future investigation on potential effects will be important. <laughs> it's like the understatement. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I'll say. Now, in this case, PEG wasn't the only curative measure they used, right? Well, they the, tried others, the, but they, they, were, they reversed too quickly. Ah. Uh, uh, and so I didn't mention them, yeah. But the peg is the one that gave them the, the cure. Ribavirin and one other. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's it doesn't cool. it's help us. I think it's very interesting. It doesn't help us save the bats, however. I wish we could have a, a strategy based on knowing something oh, more so about this. You're going to have to dip, well, dip all the bats in, in peg. peg. I yeah. was going to say, you want to dip the bats in peg? <laughs> Not, neither does what, putting, a, putting peg on every hummingbird feeder in the... Well, States. No. no, but you'd have to do it on the hibernating bats, right? So I think right. not not good. Not good. Well, there you go. That's our paper. I thought that was two cool papers. Unusual, very, right? Very unusual, so but very I nice. wanted to comment on two things. The, mm-hmm. the whole terminology of matrix potential and matrix-induced water stress. Yes. Yep. Oh, man. And, Did you have to bring that up? <laughs> <laughs> well, and then I thought, okay, when I get to materials and methods, there'll be something there about no, it. There wasn't but anything. there wasn't anything. Yeah. And then the second thing that I thought was interesting was that they talked about this fungus being capable of surviving on various substances like harvest men. And yes. I had never heard of this term before. It's oh, that's just a another spider-like term. Uh, Daddy long legs. long legs. Yeah, it is. Yes. I had never heard that. So it was, seems like it must be regional or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, I looked right. up all over the place trying to understand the matrix potential or whatever it was. And I, I could, knew you would. And I, so I was going to counting on you and I couldn't find anything no, really. I yeah. failed. You know, so this no, is I a psychoph- a, I found a lot of references. But you know, the I other thing they said is this is a psychrophilic organism. So it's cold loving fungus. It's not a temperate zone fungus. It's mm-hmm. it only really seems to grow when the temperature drops down. So is that connected? With so wait a minute. Yeah, it does because here we are. Every time we have a twiv, we always tell us what the weather is. Now that could be important. Yes. <laughs> You know, a lot of people don't like it, too. I know they don't, but that doesn't bother me one little bit. What bothers you, Dixon? Anything? Oh. <laughs> you not being nice. Where yet. should I start? Actually, you told me it doesn't matter at all. <laughs> no, you know, come on. You told me it doesn't matter. It, well, you know, that's not true. I think, personally, that people like conflict. Well, they thrive on it because <laughs> yeah. that's basically the basis for competition. What, what's your yes. three C's? And, you know, getting grants and... Uh, and well, in all, all stories, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I'm only joking, so... I we don't do know, that everybody out there conflict. does know that. I mean, come yes. on. I want to tell you, um, speak this, I, this I paper. Did, I, I did want to comment um, that the, they talk about the, the level of variation that they see across these clades, clades and they, they point out specifically that that's, that implies that this virus was introduced to this fungus fairly recently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a highly virulent thing right now. But. So it uh, so, right, so, so, it, so um, it lines up with kind of the timeline of white nose syndrome what, what, becoming a big problem. What mm-hmm. experiment would you like to see done? Good question. All right. Now I don't think it's easy because if you say bats, you got to get them to hibernate. Right? Then you got to yeah. And that's not easy. I would guess it's hard enough having bat colonies. In the I'd lab. like to see more European samples and Asian samples. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, the obvious experiment is to take a naive bat and infect him with uh, virus plus and virus minus fungus and see who gets white nose. Yeah, maybe you don't even have to have them hibernating. Maybe you could just. I don't know what happens if you infect a bat that's not hibernating with this fungus, if it causes any problems. Or what would happen if you immunize the bats against the virus? <laughs> Gee, how would the antibody get inside the fungus, Dixon? Hey, you know, maybe they don't have to get inside. Maybe it gets eaten and then... Oh, uh, no. we, maybe the virus induces some pathogenic factor, and that's what I'd like to see next. Well, that would be work. That hmm. would be yes. A simpler experiment would be to see um, if the viral antigens are expressed in any way that you can detect on Correct. the surface of the fungus. That's right. That's you know, with those um, <coughs> double stranded RNA viruses in uh, Giardia or Trichomonas, Trichomonas. What, yes. it's, it was shown, and we did the paper on Twitter. Did that. The double strand RNAs induce an inflammatory response. That's right. It's like a toll-like reception. Yeah, That's and that right. makes right. the infection more of greater pathogenicity. Exactly. So something in, could be involved here. Yeah. Anyway, so, those uh, of it, you working it, on bats, go for it. So this is a trans-kingdom mm-hmm. study mm-hmm. worthy of note. Yeah. Sorry, Rich Condit. Uh, well, with respect to that uh, double-stranded RNA inducing the inflammatory response, uh, it's just a little 
sideshow here. This this behaves kind of like a uh, a real virus, where the double stranded RNA is encapsidated, mm-hmm. and there's a polymerase in the capsid right. that mm-hmm. makes single stranded RNA that gets uh, you know uh, that that codes for capsid proteins and other stuff, and makes new capsids and encapsidates the single stranded RNA before you make the second strand. So the double-stranded RNA is never exposed to the cytoplasm. Right. So it uh, doesn't then trigger the immune res- the innate immune response in the cells. Yeah, but these vir- these double-stranded RNA viruses of Giardia and Trichomonas, same thing. The same st- thing? They're similar viruses, but somehow the host is sensing mm-hmm. that th- somehow That's it gets right. into That's the right. cytoplasm. That's right. Right. Uh, well, it must be it, no, not, nothing's perfect, as you like to nothing's say. Nothing's perfect. Exactly. <laughs> Another thing <laughs> right. we learned from this paper is that uh, brown bats from North America don't migrate over into Europe because bats do uh, migrate. Mm. They're a migratory animal, and uh, at least some species are. And so, so far, so good. But uh, could they but, go that far, Dixon? No, no. But the wind can blow them off. Huh. That's the point. You know, when that they would start be, migrating, then that would be a long, an impressive distance. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty far. No, but, you know, they speculated that's how West Nile virus got over here. It's it's not true, but that, that it was part of their speculation because they had some evidence that some migratory birds that were only found in Europe could sometimes be found here, too. Could a mosquito be blown across the Atlantic? You bet, absolutely. And it would yes. live? Sure. Why not? Wow. And how long would that take? Depends on the hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not kidding. So some of those hurricanes yeah, could easily yeah, transport yeah. organisms in a day or two, even. If anything, they are. It's how dengue creatures. got into Bangladesh, basically. You know, so when you look well, around, well, that's how that's how you find finches in the Galapagos. Yeah, I see, that's you know, exactly it. Colonization of remote islands in general. You got it. All right, let's do some email. Yeah. Wait, just one one last thing. <laughs> yep. When uh, the fossils or dinosaurs, uh, and I include myself there, were excited <laughs> about the gels, we forgot oh, to mention be. that they even did northern blots. That's right. What yeah, yes. gels? Sanger sequencing. Uh, yes. Oh, it's a classic paper. And I'll bet you none of <laughs> none of you guys, I bet you none of you guys caught the fact that one of the pieces of evidence that it was double stranded RNA was that it stuck to Wattman CF11 in the present. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Okay. That's right. And that's what we know, used to call a Franklin column. The word this is, is old ear. school paper. None of ear. You have to say none of ear. Like none, none of ear. Of, <laughs> none of right. ear. That's right. <laughs> I have your ear. Y'all. All right. <laughs> we have an email from John who writes, Hi, TWIV team. I love viruses, and I would love a copy of Principles of Virology. I do love TWIV and the rest of the Twix family. I don't have a background in biology, only in software engineering, but I find the podcast extremely accessible. The biography CVs are a great insight into the meandering paths many working scientists take, and after listening to a lot of the back episodes, I am eventually absorbing some of the technical discussion by osmosis. The new year might be the time to attempt Vincent's online virology course. <laughs> oh, it is wonderful. Due to TWIP and Parasitic Diseases 6th Edition, I may never eat a, eat meat again unless it has been incinerated. <laughs> well, you can actually overcook your meat. <laughs> you can freeze it. Ceviche and tartar are out. So is wild game. I may never swim in warm water, touch a pet, do anything involving soil, or walk barefoot. If only the podcast wasn't so compelling, <laughs> I could just stop listening to that instead. Mm. I, I kind of have to agree with John that <laughs> just it does kind of put you off of some kinds of food and exploring exotic places, I, yeah. it sounds like. Well, I, I had a, it's, my it's, parasitology professor in college, somebody at some point about halfway through the course said, uh, well, uh, Dr. Lauterbach, you know, what if you're going to one of these tropical places? And, and she said, after this class, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, talking about walking barefoot, listen to the last twip. Right, Dixon? Mm-hmm. Right. Since you asked about other podcasts, I also listened to many of the podcasts. Others have suggestion, but I didn't hear BBC Radio 4's In Our Time with Melvin Bragg being mentioned. It's a podcast of the radio show where the host and three acknowledged experts cooperatively discuss the week's topic for 45 minutes. Topics include a broad sampling from science, technology, mathematics, religion, philosophy, history, the arts, and culture. There is a back catalog of about 700 episodes. Twixers might enjoy the origins of infectious disease, June 2011. Microbiology, March 2, 27. 
immunization, April 2006, genetic mutation, December 2007, at which point I must stop and ask, what the hell is genetic mutation? <laughs> Isn't it just mutation? Since mutation yeah. means change of a nucleotide sequence. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's a redundancy. Galen, October 2013, Anatomy, February 22. Thanks for the hard work on Twiv, Twip, Twim, Twivo. Best regards and a happy and prosperous New Year, John Limerick, Ireland. Ironically, I didn't enter the Limerick competition. But he did have a good zinger. By the way, Al Gore didn't invent the internet, but he did invent computer science. Where do you think computer algorithms come from? Oh, (laughs) (laughs) that is a pun worthy of you, my man. Yes. Um, Yeah. So just a little comment here. I think when radio stations take their shows and make podcasts out of them, it's not really a podcast. A podcast is people like us who don't do radio, just sitting around talking, you know. Because radio they have all this tech and they have producers and music and blah, blah, blah. I think it's radio. It's not podcasting. It's my opinion. Your mileage may vary. This so what happens, a, radio. <laughs> what happens if a podcast gets rebroadcast on the radio? Mm. Well, I guess it's still a podcast. If they don't change it to be on the radio, then, but, you know, that's the amateur part of it. Okay. Oh, okay. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. A podcast lets, you, lets anyone do it. You don't need radio equipment. Oh, right. And for them to just stick it out there, all right, so they're taking advantage of the, the popularity, and that's fine, but I just don't, they should well, take it's it. Just, just it's, re- another, it's another medium through which to I guess. listen to their radio shows. And if you look at something like um, BBC, you know, it used to be that anybody in the world could listen to them with a cheap shortwave radio because yeah, they yeah, broadcasted yeah. 100,000 watts from all over the place. Um, nowadays you can't do that because they've cut down and basically gutted their whole shortwave presence. And so you have to download the shows on the internet, at which point they're effectively podcasts. Well, you can that's listen right. to them live on the internet. You can live stream all night them, here. You can live yeah. stream them on yeah. the internet. That's yeah. true. Or you can listen to them in, in what are essentially podcast format. And yeah. by the or way, our radio station just broadcasts it all night. It's a, it's a radio program. So your, okay. That's where I've heard the, uh, the, uh, in our time episodes your college station uh yeah i was thinking of doing that with twiff just broadcast 24 7 all the old up <laughs> now that we have a back catalog we could do that I wonder, if, I wonder if anyone would listen then you reach syndication and it's yes. no longer a podcast <laughs> you know with all the with the big broadcasters leaving shortwave you can actually lease um time on on those major stations as well you could turn this into a radio show yeah how do you do that well, we'll talk. You have to get more Patreon equipment. Yeah, cool. right. <laughs> it's probably not worth the effort. No. No. All right, uh, Kathy, can you take the next one, please? Sure. James writes, hello, I'm sending this email hoping to win a copy of Principles of Virology. When typing the subject of this email, I love viruses, a thought came to mind that I have had since I took Latin during undergrad, which Twivers may find of interest. From what I understand, the word virus is derived from the second declension noun virus in Latin, meaning poison, venom, or slime. Thus, when plural, it is viri. However, this did not carry over into the English for some reason. But when we pluralize the word syllabus, we do say syllabi, also a second declension noun in Latin. Bill Nye, in his book Undeniable, adds that he thinks that virus should be pluralized to vira. (laughs) I think he says this... Because second declension nouns that are neuter tend to pluralize with an a suffix, while masculine nouns pluralize with a long i suffix. Then finally, Dr. William S. Halbrick, in his book Medical Meanings, makes the comment, they, parentheses viruses, never were, are, or should be called by the quasi-Latin plural viri. (laughs) But he does not go on to explain why. Why, why, have I mean. <laughs> <laughs> have any of the trusted scientists of TWIV pondered this issue? Thank you for all you do. So, <laughs> is it fungus, fungi, or fungus? Or fungi. Or fungi. <laughs> it is octopus. I know that. It is. Some people I've heard, I had a student who used to call them viri, but he was pedantic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've never heard anything to say. I've never heard anyone say viri. Have you, Kathy? I haven't. Oh, I I have heard it jokingly. Yeah, but. jokingly. But we should call it viruses. And my license plate is viruses, not viri. So that's the end of the story. That's it. Right. There you go. <laughs> it's definitive. 
Yeah. Because it is. Yes. Uh, Alan, can you take the next one, please? Jarrett writes, hello, all. I'm gunning for that 23rd spot to get my hands on principles of virology. <laughs> it was my goal last summer to watch all of, all of the virology lectures Dr. Rack and Yellow posts on YouTube. However, I didn't make it past lecture number three as I got distracted by pursuing my certification as a Texas master naturalist. Mm-hmm. And gives a link for an explanation about that. Sounds pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Now that I'm well on my way to master naturalist status, it's time to finally knock out that fantastic free virology course. So I'm hoping to take to have the book as a companion. The weather in Austin is an insultingly <laughs> warm 21 degrees C or 70 Fahrenheit, hardly conducive to the holiday spirit. However, it does bring out the bugs, which for an insect collector is a real treat. Happy New Year, and thanks for keeping me company while I walk to work, make dinner, and clean the kitchen. Rich, you might want to make contact here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah this, I another, mean, I'll tell you. Another off there's Austin. A twift, there's a TWIF party happening in Austin. Yes. <laughs> <gasps> hmm. As you can see, we got some emails for the, to win the book. Um, D- Rich, you should be next. Yeah. You're on my list. Becky writes, hi, all. Thank you so much for your very enjoyable podcast. I am a new postdoc in Dr. Anna Marie Pyle's lab at Yale University, and my project involves the structure of the RNA genome of flaviviruses and RNA protein interactions underlying HCV infection. RNA viruses are super interesting because the genome itself can do so much in cells based on RNA folding to adopt interesting structures. Think of irises, etc. I am new to virology. I have a cell and molecular biology background, and I love the perspectives gained by listening to your podcast. I actually found TWIB because I was looking up virology textbooks so that I could get a more well-rounded understanding of the field. I read that Principles of Virology is the best out there, and after looking up Dr. Rack and Yellow, I found the podcast. I've been listening on my commute, and I'm working my way backward. I haven't yet purchased the book, but I'm hoping that I might be the 23rd emailer. <laughs> Thanks for all the work you do to make this podcast. It must take a lot of effort and dedication to have kept it up for so long. I'm going. I'm looking forward to hearing more. Great, thank you, Becky. And Becky is the winner. Oh, is that right? All right, all right. right. Uh, Congratulations, yeah. Becky. Nice going. Good job. So it sounds like it'll be well used. Yeah. 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 Hey, hey, Dixon. I'll take the next two. How's that? You bet. So Sam writes, especially the ones I can study and not catch. No, 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 no. He, Sam he, writes? That's he, what he wrote. Yeah, but before that, there was, <laughs> I love viruses especially. Yeah. Sorry, you didn't see that because you don't refresh your... Uh, You're microphone. right, I don't see that. Go ahead. So, so, okay, especially the ones I can study and not catch. Am I the 23rd? Well, we now know that you're the 24th. Sorry. <laughs> uh, here in Tucson, it's forecast to be cloudy with a high of 72 and a low of 54, followed by considerable rain and much colder temperatures in the next few days. Wilkie writes, Dear Twiv Academia, I consider myself a nerd, nerd enough to have taken the great Coursera courses on virology, nerd enough to be a regular Twivist, <laughs> nerdy enough to have flashbacks to presentations in settings similar settings similar to the Elk Trout Unlimited, shout out to Hamilton chapter, as described in 417. The mention of, in Prince high quality environmental DNA rang some nerdy bell, and I recall reading an article in 2014 using these methods to test for the presence of Asian carp, a really pain-in-the-neck invader from across the sea, and uh, we would love to know where that thing is heading, and he gives uh, a reference to it, and... um, and also improved methods for capture, extraction, and quantitative uh, indirect non-invasive detection of rare aquatic microfauna using aqueous environmental DNA, eDNA, is a relatively new approach to population and biodiversity monitoring. I hope that you realize how much of an impact you have on so many people. I know I am personally grateful. Wilkie. And he's a retired flight re- re- registered nurse. <coughs> she, I should say. Or he. I don't know whether it's a he either. Sorry, I'm going to find out. Into profile like that. Yeah, so that was a very interesting visit I had to the uh, Hamilton chapter. That was for a twim. But we're working on going back next summer. Yes. And I'm trying to get Dixon to come with me. Oh, no, you don't have to try. You don't have to try. I will be there. Montana and a trout. I'm there in July. Are you joking? So a young lady (laughs) from uh, 
uh, local environmental protection something in, I think, Missoula. She gave a talk on eDNA, and we're going to try and do a podcast with her. How about that, Dixon? That's cool. going to be That'd fantastic. Be fun. And maybe we'll visit the, uh, the Biomimicry Institute while we're there, too. Is it, where's that? It's in Missoula. Okay, sure. But it looks like a storefront. Exactly. It does? Have you been? <laughs> It it's does. I've, I've oh, to, oh, okay. Sorry. It is a storefront, basically, but it's uh, it's it looks like high power, <laughs> high power stuff. No, it it, it is. Uh, it's very unobtrusive. It's true. The next one is. Is it okay if I proceed, everyone? Let's go. Next one's from our friend Michelle Osborne, who's on Twiv. Hello, Vincent. Have you ever discussed virological techniques besides the famous black assays, specifically virion isolation and purification, on Twiv or any other forum? What I'm really interested in knowing is how our hardcore virology colleagues view the pros and cons of purifying virions for use in studies that are aimed to characterize virus cell interactions. I'll try to make my point as concisely as possible. In natural transmission of virions, person to person or cell to cell, the particles may be more or less isolated, like flu in a sneeze droplet compared to HPV in a sloughed skin cell. However, the particles are not likely to be isolated or purified to the extent that we often like to accomplish in the lab when attempting to perform controlled experiments. Have you heard or engaged in conversations where anyone has discussed how more or less purification of virions might confound studies where entry receptors are being sought? To give you my scientific perspective, we published a paper back in 2012 in PLOS Pathogens wherein we found HPVs, human papillomaviruses, become decorated with heparan sulfonated proteoglycans with which many viruses interact and growth factors during their quest to become internalized in host cells, keratinocytes. This follows normal heparin sulfate proteoglycan biology where growth factors are sequestered on HSPGs on the plasma membrane or in the extracellular matrix and made available to cells. This is particularly important in the context of epithelial wounding, which is also known to potentiate HPV infection. I have a concern that we are over-purifying HPVs in the lab and that in the natural setting of transmission, virions might be released from infected cells in a state that is already decorated. I hope I'm making my point that the kinetics of infection and cellular interactions might be drastically altered depending on virus purity. I need more virologists with whom to ponder these processes. By the way, I'm planning soon to have an HPV plaque assay with which to wow you all at TWIV. Cheers and Happy New Year. Of course, Michelle is a professor at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. Works on HPV. So this is an interesting idea. idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. I haven't really considered it. Nope, I have not. And um, if any of you out there have thought about this, but it certainly could make a difference if there are proteins stuck on the surface. Sure. Right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm terms of virus and you know there are many viruses for which we cannot identify receptors and it could be maybe they're too pure right right who knows so yes i think uh, michelle that is an interesting issue and of course the key is to, to, to demonstrate it experimentally right so demonstrate that having something stuck makes a difference not sure that's so easy and it might even explain cases where we can't seem to culture a virus yeah, maybe. You know, maybe it's coming out of the cells with the decoration that it needs to get into the next cell, and then you take that isolate and you filter it to get the crud, the bacteria out, and you do some other stuff, and then you put it on cultured cells and can't get in. Yep. That that, that well, certainly would be that, interesting to look into. Yeah, yeah certainly that was uh, that's similar to the observations, um, Stephanie Kurse observations with uh, norovirus. Yeah. Right. Where the purified virus itself is not infectious in B cells, but if the the stuff that's in stool, because there's a apparently a bacterial co- uh, cofactor, does the trick. Mm-hmm. Well, send in your thoughts and your money. <laughs> <laughs> Give us your tired, your poor, your money. Let's do one more, <laughs> Kathy. That last one. Sure, Anthony writes. The text in the screenshot is from William Burroughs' Naked Lunch, published in 1959. Some say that it predicts AIDS. He starts off with lymphogranuloma, parentheses, actually caused by a bacteria, which is associated with AIDS. Burroughs refers to a disease from Kenya. He says that the spread is enabled by sexual transmission, unlike the diseases with jungle vectors and worldwide travel. According to McLuhan, it's not that artists predict the future, but that they see the present. 
the illusion of prophecy results when everyone else is looking backwards instead of ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, yep. Neat. And then he gives a screenshot of this quote, and I think we can just let the readers or the listeners check that out online if they want to yeah. see that. Well, you know, if you read the uh, History of AIDS by Jacques Pepin, he, he he was a physician in Africa, and he said there there were probably lots of of cases of uh, immunosuppression caused by AIDS that were just not picked up, you know, before we discovered it in the 80s elsewhere. And so it's very possible that if Burroughs was there in, in Africa, he, he saw something that, you know, looked like AIDS and was characterized by immunosuppression and opportunistic infections. Mm. And that could be reflected. I don't know if he actually was. the way She says he was in Kenya, so mm. possible. He may not have predicted and, it, but just observed it, right? Or yeah, maybe. <clears throat> but at the same time, if you have, um, if you've read anything by William Burroughs or even seen the movie Naked Lunch or read the book, um, it's he's trippy. Mm. He's really, really, really trippy. <laughs> what makes you say that? So it's it's entirely <laughs> possible that this is just you know something that uh, that seeped out of his mind and um, <laughs> seeped out to every that, to. That happens to yeah. coincide with something that actually occurred. I think for William Burroughs, everything is sexually transmitted. Yes, yeah, everything is sexually transmitted. Yeah, very Henry much. Miller and William Burroughs must have been yeah. cellmates somewhere. So Ooh. they eventually, I didn't mean that in the virological sense either, no. by the way. Well, I like uh, the quote from uh, Mc, Mc, Marshall McLuhan. McLuhan. Yeah. I mean, that's true. Artists look at the present right. and figure out what's going on. So yeah. that could be. All right, time to do some picks. Mm -hmm. And Jared, if you know we do this on Twiv, uh, you, if you have anything you'd like to share, think about it as we're talking. We'll come back to you. you Certainly. Can, you can also say no, but that's fine. Uh, Alan, what do you have today? I have um, a handy little tool. If you go out and do anything and you want to put together a picture of where you were, it's called GPS Visualizer. Um, and you can take this thing and take the file from your GPS, um, if you've been out hiking or um, flying or wherever you've been, upload it and it will convert it into a format that you can then plot on something like Google Earth. Huh. Cool. And it'll give it to you in 3D. Um, I came across this because a lot of people use it in aviation to, um, you know, you go and you, you practice patterns or maneuvers or what have you and then you can come back and you can load your gps file if you had a gps on for that whole thing that's fantastic and you get a nice 3d view of exactly where you were in space and you can you can analyze your own performance it's very very cool where do you get the file from the gps file it's just um any hmm. gps that will plug into your computer like hmm. i i have um i gosh i have a couple of different ones um i don't no, there, there's probably some way to get this out of your phone. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know how to do that, right? Because uh, they're locked down. <laughs> right, but I've... I, there has to be a have, way, yeah. I have one for the pl for flying, and I have um, one for hiking that's a that's a handheld, handheld or geocaching. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and you could, those, you just plug them into the computer, and they, the files are right there. This is great. I mean, I can, my mind went, uh, to all kinds of directions when you said that, Alan, because uh, when I accompany Vincent next uh, July out to Hamilton, Montana, I'm going to yes. try to cajole him into joining me on a float uh, for fishing. And it would be great to have the GPS device working the whole time. And then you go back and you can actually see where you, what part of the river you were. I'll leave it up to you to figure it out. That's oh, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna work on this. Since because, you're a technology guy. Oh yeah. Well, oh, yeah. high tech. That's my middle. No, name. if you have if you have like a backpacking GPS of a yeah. Garmin e Trex or something, yeah, yeah. you just turn it on and take it with you. Exactly. And then you can upload the file into this thing and load it into convert it to Google That's Maps or Google Earth great. or what have you, and it'll show you exactly where you were. Marvelous. All right, Dixon. That's, that's your job, okay? Or it's I my guess job. You, could, you could attach the GPS to your dog or what have you. Yeah. <laughs> yep. uh, all kinds mode. of things you could do with this. I'm not your dog, Dixon. No, you're not no. my dog. You can't attach it to me. No. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, so I'm digging back into my uh, sci fi history. This is fairly recent history. And uh, I'm choosing a book called Red Mars. 
it's part of a trilogy. I, to tell you the honest truth, I haven't read the other two books in a trilogy. They are uh, Blue Mars and Green Mars. The okay. author is Kim Stanley Robinson, published in 1993, and it's about the colonization of Mars. Pretty good. Not bad. Cool. It's fiction, that, right? Science one, fiction. Science fiction. Won the Nebula Award. Hmm. And you have read this recently or a long time? I have uh, a year ago. So what's this? You're reading a big series that Kathy told you about. What's that again? Oh, huh. that that doesn't fit as a twib pick. I just this is the Bloody oh, Jack series. Okay. There could be some science as much as there you is in so? any of yeah. You learn things about sailing and all kinds of stuff. What, and we're not reading it; we're listening to it. It's how many books it, uh, is it? Twelve. Twelve. And w- where are you at eight? Done uh, and Kat, started it. I'm partway through number three again, <laughs> second <I'm>, time. <laughs> oh my gosh! And I'm in book eleven. What makes this series amazing is the woman who narrates it. This has accents from all over the globe. Wow! It's cool. got several different English accents, American accents, French, Spanish, Irish, Scottish, Chinese, Indian. You name it. And she is amazing. The characterizations wow. are so good, you can you can recognize what character is coming on by the voice, and you form an impression of this person in your head. Okay, uh, she's just absolutely phenomenal. It would be uh, reading the books would be nothing compared to listening to the audiobooks. They're just amazing. Thank you, Kathy. You're They're just absolutely amazing. <laughs> Gee. Oh, by what the way, you- hey, fu- go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, I was a different topic. Were you going to keep on in this? No, that's okay. Nope. Uh, Vendee Globe update. The leader is 3,000 miles from the finish. Mm-hmm. It's it's going to happen pretty soon. <laughs> They're uh, halfway back up the um, mm-hmm. Atlantic Ocean. And the my uh, my favorite, Alex Thompson, is just 200 miles behind the leader. So anything could still happen. Yes. After, what, 21,000 miles. Good uh, There's just a 200-mile 200, 200 difference between them. Dixon, what do you have? Well, I actually have two things, if you'll allow me. Um, <clears throat> the first one is a website that, uh, no pun intended, of course, uh, it uh, champions the newest uh, space telescope effort, which is the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, to be put into a, uh, a million mile away from Earth. Um, I'm not sure if it's a geosynchronous orbit or whether it's, I know it's got to be an orbit because otherwise... A million miles pit. up is not geosynchronous. No, I understand but. that. <laughs> but I just, I just wondered how they were going to separate out the sunlight from what they wanted to look at. And I thought maybe if they positioned it in such a way that the Earth got in the way. But that's just my crude thinking about this. Probably No, I think they, I think they just point it. Uh, in the opposite the direction. Side, they've, right. right. They've shielded the opposite side carefully. Yeah, I yeah, think okay. that's the idea. It's due to be launched, I guess, in another year from now and everybody's holding their breath that it'll go off and it'll show us things that we could never even imagine right now and this uh, is the successor to the hubble that's right mm. i'm really so looking considering to that. what the hubble has shown us hopes are very very high for this exactly right. very very cool and it has a lot of infrared uh, detectors on it so that we can see some of the early background uh, after the big bang and all that stuff so the other yeah. pick that i have is very self-serving it involves an article in the New Yorker magazine that just came out uh, by Ian Fraser, and it's uh, about a new vertical farm that opened up in Newark, and uh, it's filled with an illustration, and uh, you can actually download this article online without having to buy the New Yorker. And uh, he spent about a, a morning in my apartment interviewing me in terms of the role that we've had in, in making this idea uh, more real than it was when we first started, and it's a charming article, and it's really uh, a privilege to be <laughs> said, profiled in the New Yorker magazine. So I just wanted you to know that this is my big this ego trip fiction. for the year. Listen, this is fiction. <laughs> I, I, quote, I quote from the article. Yeah. He says, he, you live in Fort Lee, that's fine. Yeah. He is a cheerful, demonstrative man with a short gray beard and a mobile face. What's wrong with that? <laughs> You're not cheerful. <laughs> I have a mobile face. Oh, he's truly cheerful. <laughs> oh. yeah. Vincent, Vincent, Vincent. Very nice, Dixon. Yeah, I, I was cool. uh, quite uh, taken yes. by it and uh, deeply appreciate you know, this, the opportunity. Uh, it starts off talking about aero farms, which yeah. we visited a long time ago. That's right. We did a and they're doing very well now, by the way. So I'm glad to see that uh, nice. they're... So have you gotten uh, 
Lots of phone calls? Yeah, I got a lot of, uh, you know, way to go, that sort of thing, pats on the back. Did Trump call you? You know, yeah. I'm fortunate that he didn't. Sorry. <laughs> Kathy, what do you have? I picked snowflakes. So I got this right. book from Isabel, and the article then led me to another article about the same person. Wilson Bentley in 1885, a farmer in Vermont, became the first known person to photograph a snowflake. Wow. He documented 5,000 of them in his lifetime. <laughs> and it turns out that he was taking these snowflake pictures on white, and he realized that they would be more impressive hmm. if they could be <laughs> on a black background. So he scraped away from the negatives the material so that they he could print them as wow. white You're snowflakes kidding. on black. Oh, my God. So, yeah, they're just oh, wow. amazing. Oh, wow. And um, I know we had a pick once before from Johnny, our listener in Boston, but uh, that was a, a different aspect of snowflake photography. So this is the more ancient variety, but they're really beautiful. So yeah. check them look, out. This guy was just a farmer in Vermont who was fascinated Good. with snowflakes and he got a camera which at that time was not a trivial thing and decided to take this up and kind of made it his life's work yeah and he kind of died doing it too because yes he walked six miles home through a blizzard after he'd oh, taken no. some photographs and mm. got pneumonia oh got how pneumonia. sad this picture here of him he's got a long coat on a shirt and tie and a nice top hat wow. and he's taking wow. his pictures so i like this line he says a true scientist wishes above all to have his photographs as true to nature as possible. And if retouching will help in this respect, then it is fully justified. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we retouch. He said that. He said that because he was accused of uh, doing things to his images by a, by a meteorologist. Right. And of course, we retouch all the time uh, with Photoshop now and, yep. and other things to, to help make things more natural. Just well, have to do it the right way. Hello. Yeah. Jared, do you have anything to share with us? Sure. Uh, as a proper Luddite, I'm afraid I have nothing technological to contribute. I think I'm, I think I'm still using a pager. Um, wow. <clears throat> but you live in South Carolina. That's modern stuff. Well, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's amazing that I can read, let me tell you. But aside from all that, I guess being here at TWIV today and being humbled by the great minds around me. <laughs> Weird. That, this uh, is called pandering. You know, when I, I he don't was know walking if you know in. that or not. But <laughs> We know better. Let me finish my glowing endorsement. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, I could at least um, maybe say something to any undergraduates that might be listening in uh, as an older student who's who's still going through it, and uh, that would be not to not to forget to do these these three things which were given to me in a college speech: um, learn a foreign language, learn a sport that you can play into your golden years. <clears throat> and learn a musical instrument. Uh, aside from that, when I got in today, uh, Vincent and I were discussing pseudoscience, which he had addressed in his blog, and how we have to be ever vigilant against that. And trying to find the straight of anything is problematic in the in the lightest terms. I mean, who of us knows to go past the first three pages on Google? to a LexisNexis database, to even have the tenacity to read through a randomized controlled trial study, to figure out anything. And we have an issue in science now where we must simplify a great many things to, to, to reach our audience, and in doing so, we lose information and we get people claiming that climate change isn't real for that. But uh, I had this quote from Edmund Burke, which was given to me by... Dr. Robert Ball, um, who was head of DHEC in South Carolina for a great many years and my mentor, and I'd like to share that with you all now, and it is, those who carry on great public schemes must be proof against the most fatiguing delays, the most mortifying disappointments, the most shocking insults, and what is worst of all, the presumptuous judgments of the ignorant. Great. All right. Very nice. Cool. Thank you very much. All right, we'll end up on my pick, which is a little self-serving because it's a my daughter's first blog post. Yeah. Yeah. Extremely well written. Mm -hmm. yes. Really nice. She she uh, applied to contribute to this site called Fresh U, you know, about fre for freshmen by freshmen. Hmm. And uh, she said, the editor said, 
who wants to write about mental illness? And she said, oh, I'll write about Carrie Fisher. So she wrote this article, Carrie Fisher fought for the Rebel Alliance and for mental health awareness. So it's all about hmm. her and what she did and so forth. It's a nicely written article. I'm very proud of her. But um, at the end, Really, really good. The end, she says, hi, I'm Nadia. I'm currently a freshman at Ithaca College. Yeah. I'm majoring in English and hope to double minor in women and gender studies and politics. So I've learned something here. I didn't know this. <laughs> <laughs> it's how fathers find these things out. I love yeah. debating, playing dominoes and ma- mahjong, drinking root beer, watching the same movie several times in one sitting, and sleeping. And she does. Does it think sleeping. I have a debate team? Uh, yes, they do. Um, mm. <clears throat> I, I'm not sure what she's going to do. She was on JSA in high school and did, okay. a, lo- did a lot of debating. Junior Statesman of America. I tell, that, I tell everybody they should join the debate team in and, college. Uh, she loved it. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure what she's doing. I, I asked her if she was going to join it, but I'm not sure. As you know, I don't know what she's doing, really. Right. Anyway, I hope she writes a lot. And I said, what's your next article? And she said, well, I haven't been given one. I said, well, you need to propose things and be aggressive. And she looked at me like I was an idiot. <laughs> I said, why don't you write about the impact of virus infections on freshmen? And she walked away. Right. <laughs> that was a, uh, oh, expected dad. response. Oh, dad. Yes. Oh, dad. <laughs> what <Yeesh. this? laughs> uh, we have two listener picks. One is from uh, Ken, who um, wrote our letter at the top of the show. My listener pick is Adam's Lab website, where he has some videos of some of his microfluidic contraptions in action. High speed video microscopy slowed down a lot. This is his collaborator. Yeah, those are cool. I looked at several of them. <clears throat> And Sean writes, good morning, esteemed professors, or should I say, fellow virology nerds. I came across this article entitled The Death of Expertise, and I thought would, I would share it with you for an open discussion. And uh, he, he gives an article, a link to an article in The Federalist called The Death of Expertise, which is very relevant to what we discuss often, in which Jared mentioned here, um, that... Um, Fewer and fewer people are experts. Don't want, to, don't want to be. They think it's bad to be an expert and so forth. Well, then people don't listen to experts anymore. I don't want to listen either. Although I'm studying to get a PhD in public health, I still find myself having conversations with people that refuse to believe that vaccines do not, in fact, cause autism or that insert current diet fad here works more effectively than a balanced diet with exercise. I have observed that this trend is not exclusive to one political affiliation or another. I have many self-proclaimed progressive acquaintances that continue to admonish wheat gluten as a toxic substance, even though I haven't seen any dose-response curves that compare wheat gluten to the likes of bisphenol A or methyl bromide. Does your team have any advice for how young scientists like me can better educate and communicate with people that insist their five-minute Google search is comparable to my 11 years of science education. I'm not sure if this will be email number 23, but I am thrilled to email you just the same. I listen to TWIV and TWIM during my weekly commute to work in the glorious Los Angeles traffic and always smile at the fun banter between Vincent and Dixon as well as Alan's incredibly well-timed puns. It's currently 16C, 60F, and rainy here in California, for which I'm hopeful can replenish our snowpack after years of severe drought, warm wishes from the West Coast. Sean, P.S., for those of you curious about L.A. traffic, I highly recommend seeing the movie La La Land. <laughs> mm-hmm. It it opens with a cool commentary on L.A. traffic. I haven't seen it. Do we have any advice for Sean? Alan, you must have advice. Um, yeah, I mean, this is kind of, kind of my life. Um Communicating with people who have gotten their Google degrees in something and and don't want to listen otherwise, um, I don't know. I try to I try to kind of meet them where they are. Mm. Um, this comes up talking with other parents of kids um, a little less now that um, that my daughter's past the you know the main age of vaccination and and also that she doesn't constantly need a parent accompanying her everywhere, but. Um, yeah, you know, I come across people who don't get their flu shots because they think they'll get the flu from it. Um, they read that on the internet and well, no, you actually can't. Um, <laughs> and I, I try to, you know, usually at that point in the conversation, they're already aware of my background and there is 
d- despite um, pundits saying that expertise has died, there is still some degree of respect for having a PhD in a hard science and people will listen to that, but you can't come down from on high. Um, the important thing is to connect with them as a person. Um, and, uh, and surprisingly, what often really carries a lot of weight is anecdote. And as scientists, we don't like to think in terms of of anecdote because we want to see the data, but you're actually probably better off telling somebody, you know, hey, I get my flu shot every year. Mm-hmm. That's got more weight than, you know, according to um, decades of data, this really does decrease your overall probability of getting the flu. That just goes in one ear and out the other. But to find I- out that that you personally are abiding by your own advice, that a lot of people will um, will even act on. That's a that's a huge problem. Um, yes, con- contemporarily <laughs> because there are, there are many many physicians who will not get a flu shot for whatever reason. Yes, there's a uh, a website out now. I think it's called Sane Vax, and they're rallying against Gardasil and Gardasil nine HPV <laughs> vaccines now. For me to stress this point, I have uh, half-siblings much younger than I am, and I'm in my 30s now, and I put together a small PowerPoint presentation for them about Gardasil, but at the end of it, I sat them down and I told them, I, even now, received two inoculations of Gardasil 9, and I would receive the third one in front of you right now is a, a testament to its safety. And it's like you said, anecdote, and they really did listen to that part. Mm. Yeah. I'd also uh, check out, uh, over at Microbe TV, we have other podcasts who have joined us. Um, one of them is Nina Martin's Public Health United. In episode 42, she spoke with um, uh, Megan Moran, who is is an expert on communication of this sort she's she's focused on the tobacco industry and their messaging and how you can combat that but they also go into vaccines uh, anti-vaxxers as well she has some good advice for that Uh, but just do something you know i find i I was at a high school a couple of weeks ago talking about um the the hela cell book the the immortal life and i get lots of questions about vaccines one of them was why is there so much controversy about the hpv vaccine and you know they I think they they value it when someone comes and talks to them. They appreciate that you come, and I think that makes a big difference. So if if a lot of us did that, you know, a little bit at a time, I think that would help as well. Yeah. <clears throat> now, speaking of uh, Microbe TV, so we've added uh, a number of other podcasts. We have Audio Immunity, of course, uh, Bacteriophiles from Jesse Noor, uh, Public Health United from Nina Martin, and then just this week, Omega Tau which is a podcast originating out of Germany. Uh, and they do science and engineering. It's a very different focus from us, but oh. interesting stuff, good stuff. Check it out. And that uh, is TWIV423. If you would like to win a copy, a brand new copy of a book called Infections of Leisure. Now, this is a book mm. published by the American Society for Microbiology. It's all about the infections you can get from doing different things. Let me tell you some of the chapters. This is a great book. I love it. I happen to have two, (laughs) and I'm going to give one away. Uh, Here we go. Infections from the ocean, fresh water, uh, (laughs) campers, what you can get by camping, the garden, the dog, the cat, the bird, the house pet, the rat, (laughs) the zoo, uh, sports, travel, sex. That's a big one. Body piercing and tattoos, high altitude, air travel, cruise ships. And, of course, we cannot forget exotic cuisine. <laughs> Do they well. have anything on fly uh, fishing? <laughs> yeah, a <laughs> list of all my favorite things. <laughs> Come they on. Had, uh, camping, that's about as close as they well, got. That's... High altitude, no, that wouldn't cover it. No, no. Do you have a, a thing you could contribute on fly fishing? I do because uh, it's difficult to carry enough water to last an entire day. Um, because, you know, you're busy in the early morning until almost dark. And that covers about a 12-hour period. 
So where do you get your drinking water from after you've drunk hmm. everything in the little bag on the back of your uh, your vest? And the answer is a lot of fishermen say, how oh, the hell would I just drink the water? Because it looks nice. Yes. Bring a oh, I, yeah. I love cryptosporidium, don't you? <laughs> well, or Giardia or, you know, hmm. um, something even worse than that, you know, like Listeria. Um, hmm. But they take chances. So the trick is to learn where the springs are. And go to the springs, and if you can find a good spring, then you're in good luck, or find a melting snowbank or something like that. Mm. But there's a lot of people that come back with uh, diarrheal diseases that, that that shouldn't be. No, the trick is to pack a little bottle of iodine tablets. Uh, yeah, but that works in some of them. It won't kill off Giardia. It doesn't kill um, off the cyst of Giardia. Yes. You said it if does. You, if, you, if you do it properly. Well. Anything that can survive that nasty tasting I, iodine. I water think the uh, <laughs> well, that's another thing, of course. But I think the porcelain filters that have uh, a zero point one micron um, range are great, but they take such a long time to process. And they won't the help water. you against viruses. And they won't help you against viruses. Yeah. So I yeah. think you know, recreational fishermen are, are at risk because they uh, do tend to run out of water before they need to. Well, campers too, canoers. I uh, yeah. years ago we used to. Yep. We used, to, we used to camp with the Boy Scouts, and we used yep. to carry these filtration devices. <laughs> and um, remember, one we had to set up overnight because it took so long. Right. And the thing that the big five gallon thing filled up, and then at some point it tipped over and it all spilled out. And I, oh no! Nothing there. There's nothing more refreshing though than dipping your paddle into the middle of a lake and raising it and drinking the water that comes off it. That's fantastic, and that's pretty safe actually. Okay. Uh, apparently, I'll take your you just. Word. I just uh, PubMedded this um, so article from Wilderness Environmental Medicine, 1997. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gerba et al. found that Jardia is actually uh, Jardia actually does get inactivated by iodine fairly well, depending on the pH. Cryptosporidium, not so much. Not so much. Yeah. Okay. So crypto would be the right. thing to worry about. I'm sure it's in our sixth edition. I just have to read it. <laughs> I, I generally boil the water if I'm drinking from a stream yeah, anyway. Yeah. So that, that's right. But if you're at high altitude, that's also a problem. because the Then you wait a couple extra minutes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. If you'd like a, to win this copy, it's really a great book. Then you can read it and send us questions that we can't answer. Um, <laughs> send an email to twiv at microbe.tv. Make the subject line infections of leisure. And uh, the... Let's see, what number should we go for here? Let's try. <laughs> yeah, pick a prime number. You need a prime number. You think? Yeah. 17? Sure. Sure. 17th emailer will win. Let me write that down so I remember. 17. You can find Twiv at iTunes, microbe.tv slash Twiv, or on your cell phone. Just get a podcatcher app and bring it down for free. You can subscribe. And do send your questions and comments to us, twiv at microbe.tv. Continu- uh, consider supporting our work. We do appreciate all of you who have supported us so far. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. It'll help us do more travel next year. As you heard, we're, we're going to ASV. Dixon and I will go out to Montana and much more. So thanks a lot. Dixon de Palmier, you can find him at thelivingriver.org, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Fun. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Rich Condit, formerly a professor at the <laughs> University of Florida in Gainesville, now in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Is Enjoy Twiv- the weather. <laughs> is Swiv your main uh, virus fix these days, Rich? Uh, unfortunately, yes. I was thinking about that today. It is, uh, it is my main virus fix. I used to get even in retirement. I used to get, uh, uh, you know, supplemental fixes by going into lectures and that kind of stuff. I haven't been into the university here yet. I had, uh, I had lunch with um, Chris Sullivan mm-hmm. um, before Christmas, and he put me on a bunch of mailing lists. But then the holidays uh, interrupted. But uh, fairly soon, I uh, hope to. Uh, get notification of happenings there at the university, and I'll go and visit cool. a few gigs there. We'll see. Yes, go to seminars. That'd be cool. Absolutely. All right. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. He's also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Our guest today has been Jared from Charleston, South Carolina. Thanks a lot, Jared. Thank you, Vincent. This means more to me than you know. <laughs> and good luck with the rest of college. 
I appreciate it. All right. And you know where the virologists are if you need any advice. Oh, I'll be back up here again before too long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>